Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we have another episode of PC Archaeology. We have an interesting machine here that was found in an attic by one of my local viewers named Joel. This thing was about to be thrown away and he saved it and thought it might be fun for me to take a look at, and I thought I would make a video about it. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Joel told me while up in the attic doing some HVAC work for a business, this machine was just up there abandoned. So we asked the owner if this was something that they wanted or they wanted to get rid of it. And they said they absolutely just wanted to get rid of it. So Joel grabbed it and brought it to me. So looking at this computer, you can tell here, it's obviously just a regular PCXT. It's got some interesting peculiarities about it though, which is why I wanted to take a look at it. This may end up being a super boring video, but on the other hand, it seems like when I have these random computers, we often find some cool treasures inside. So looking more closely at the front, we obviously have a PCXT clone, but they tried to differentiate things at least a little bit from the IBM PC by adding some extra vents here and some extra grooves around the front bezel. The brand of this computer is Handwell and it has an HW logo there. I am unfamiliar with this particular brand, but I must say that it's very similar looking, at least this writing right here, to the Honeywell brand. I haven't done any research on this machine, so I couldn't tell you if this is related in any way to Honeywell or if this was just some computer manufacturer that was trying to rip them off, or maybe this was a legitimate company. It also says PC-401, which might be the model number of this machine. Moving over to the right, we have a single floppy drive and probably a hard drive, I'm hoping, behind one of these covers here. If we rotate this thing onto the side, this is where things get a little strange. This thing has what looks like a reset button and the keyboard input on the side of the computer on the right side. So that's a little different than most clone machines. On the back of the machine, things are somewhat normal, although instead of having the normal PC clone power switch, which would be on the side here, the big chonky switch, we have a normal power switch here to turn the thing off and on. This is the IEC mains input. This is the IEC mains pass-through, which would go typically to your old monitor. Like the IBM 5151 monochrome monitor had this connector for power, which you could just plug into here. So it would turn the monitor on while you turned on the computer. But it also has a standard NEMA style US plug on here. So I guess you could pick and choose or probably just plug uh, something else into this, like a printer. So it would turn on when you turned your PC on. Over here at the expansion port area, we do not have a connector for the keyboard because of course that's on the side. I'm assuming when we open this up, we're gonna have a normal motherboard with some kind of a little connector that plugs in the keyboard jack and routes it over to the side of the case. Eight expansion slots as per normal. This looks like a floppy drive expansion here. There seems to be a video card. And if someone wrote C and M here, I don't know what that's all about. There's an RCA jack and RCA jack, and then we have another nine pin. But then there's also another nine pin over here and a P next to that, which implies that that's like a parallel port. Maybe that's a monochrome port. And maybe this is some kind of a custom card, especially because that RCA jack there just says in above it. And this one says out. This is obviously a serial port. It does say COM1 right there. And we have another blank. So here are the stickers on the machines. And this is kind of interesting. This top one here says CASI, Computer Amusement Systems Incorporated from 95 Morton Street, New York, New York, 10014. Probably gonna be really hard to read, but the product here says Handwell, model number PC401-SD, and then there's a serial number sticker. Now this FCC sticker here says Intelligent Date System, FCC EXK6SC, space PC-8088. So we definitely have an idea that this is gonna be an XT clone. I don't remember the exact specifics, but Joel said that the business that this was found in used to be something to do with like an arcade or a bowling alley or something to do with games. So I'm wondering if this thing was just used simply for bookkeeping or if this was actually used for any kind of control systems. And maybe that card back here that has these extra jacks on it has something to do with that. Now there was one other interesting characteristic about this case I just wanted to quickly talk about. One thing is, is it has this giant clear sticker on the top. You can kind of see here the edge of it. And I don't know what the deal is with that. If that was like some kind of an anti-wear thing that people would stick on there. So when you had to monitor on there, it wouldn't scratch up your case. And it's peeling up in the corner a little bit. And that's probably expected since this computer was stored in an attic. So it probably was uh, damp or hot or cold. and. It's surprising it's actually in as good shape as it is, to be honest. 
The other thing that's funny about this case is you notice it has the seam right here, which is also on the other side. There it is. I'm pretty sure that these types of cases, you take these two screws out, which are on the top, and then the lid either pivots up on kind of a hinge mechanism that would be over here near the front of the case, or the top part would just come off entirely and it would leave the bottom half of the case permanently attached. So with all that said, let's get these screws out of here and let's take a look at what's inside this thing. I get these computers and I have not turned this on. I have not looked at it. I have not done anything to it. So we're looking inside this machine for the first time together. All right, so those screws are out. Okay, this seems to, okay, there we go. Slides back and then up. Here we go. Well, with the lid off on first glance, definitely we have some kind of a custom card here. So we'll take a closer look at that in a second. But I'm also noticing there is no hard drive controller. So I don't think there ever was a hard drive in this thing. The slots on the back here are dusty. They don't look like they've ever been moved. And yeah, so this thing must have been booted off a floppy disk. And look at this down on the motherboard there. This thing only has 256K of RAM installed on it. So it's quite possible that there was a very special custom OS that booted and ran whatever this card did here. Or maybe it was DOS that it used, but it was just a really old version. And indeed, we have one 360K floppy drive right there. And the cable here has another connector for FDDB, but obviously it was never installed. And here's something that's kind of fascinating. There's the CPU for the motherboard and it's an NEC V20. Look how it looks like someone wiped it. There's no dust on it. I don't think it was me that just wiped the processor there. So it feels like someone else opened this computer at some point. And then they wiped their finger across the chip so they could read the part number. And then they must have gone, uh, like, whatever. <laughs> this thing is junk. And uh, put the screws back in and uh, threw it in the attic. Well, I think as per normal with PC archaeology videos, the next step is to start taking parts out of this thing. We'll give it a little clean and then we'll see if this thing works. Disassembly, well, I thought it was going to be pretty straightforward, but right away the cards were really stuck in the motherboard. They were difficult to get out. I actually couldn't get the long card out, so I just gave up for a moment and went to the power supply, which at least that came out in very straightforward fashion. Back on the card, it just took a lot of force to get it out of the motherboard. Next up are the disk drives. It was interesting, the disk drive was held into a chassis with two screws and then that whole thing slid out. Moving on to the motherboard, we have more unusual things. Normally the motherboard's held in with little plastic standoffs which slot into the case, or you might have little standoffs that are metal with screws that hold the motherboard down. Well, this case had welded in studs under the motherboard, which used little nuts to attach the motherboard to those studs. We have three connectors that go to the motherboard speaker reset, and there's the keyboard cable, which goes to the side. So I disconnect those. It also has a serial port on the back that wasn't actually attached to anything. I think it was either a placeholder or there was a card at some point that was now gone. Now, to get this motherboard out was actually really difficult because of the construction of the case. You actually had to bend the motherboard to kind of get it around the edge of the case there under that drive chassis. And that's what I'm trying to figure out here. All of the components are out of the computer. Let's take a look at them one by one. Let's start with the motherboard. This is a curious part, much more surprising, I think, than I originally suspected just when I opened the case. So you might look at this and think, wow, this is just a, a slightly rearranged XT clone. I'm not so sure about that. So the thing about this is it does have eight slots, but they are spaced more widely apart than a normal XT motherboard. Let me grab one so we can compare. Right here is a regular XT motherboard, and you can see that the eight slots there are spaced much more closely together, which is the standard size even today. This is the spacing between slots in a modern ATX case, because an ATX case just adopted the PC XT spacing. The spacing on this motherboard doesn't even look to be the same as the original PC, which had wider spacing, because the original PC had about five slots in the same space as the XT's eight slots. What that really means though, is that this case cannot accommodate any other motherboard except for, well, really probably this one. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we have 256K here, probably can accommodate 512K. And then these two banks probably take 64K RAM chips for a total of 640K. Down here at the bottom, which I put a little mark on, we have the reset and we have the speaker connection with the speaker connection being pretty non-standard compared to most of the clone boards or the original IBM boards, which use a four pin header for the speaker, which honestly could be uh, that connection right there. You can see here PC 820804-35. 
Not sure if that's a model number or is that a date code? 1982, August 4th? Now, if that is a date code, that had to be from the PCB itself because the ICs that are soldered onto this motherboard definitely herald from around 1986. So this is a later clone motherboard, which obviously dates this entire computer. The motherboard under all this dust has a pretty standard chipset. Looks all pretty much standard fare for an IBM PC clone. And we do have a V20 processor here, and that's the spot for the Mathco processor. And what is curious is we have footprints up here for another processor and the Mathco processor. So it's like an either or situation. <laughs> this was the more standard position that IBM used on their machines. And we have what looks like probably a somewhat standard power connector along with some dip switches, two sets of them. So you can take a look at those dip switches there. If you happen to have a motherboard just like this, well, that is a configuration of, well, I assume 256K. Flipping the motherboard over, we don't have any particular markings on here that might help us identify a brand or who made this. It does say B-110 there, but that doesn't really tell us anything. Construction quality seems fine. I guess it's, you know, typical for clone manufacturers. We'll definitely dump this ROM BIOS here. Can't really tell anything from the sticker on there and nothing really identifying. Next up, we have this, which is obviously the floppy drive controller. So that has the expansion connector there. We have an internal connector. Nothing much to report on this. It's just a regular clone floppy drive controller. These things were pretty common back in the day. Day codes on these ICs also far around 1986. And we have an FCC ID there if anyone is interested. Backside of the board has presumably a serial number and... There is a PC marking here, PC-820802-62. So I wonder if this was from the same manufacturer as this motherboard because that marking maybe isn't a date code and is just very similar to, I don't know, like a product line or something um, as uh, this one right here. And then next up we have this card here, which is very clearly a display card with a parallel port. So we have a 6845 here, which is the CRT controller. We have the parallel UART here, the 82C11. We have a national semiconductor large scale IC. We have either like a character ROM or maybe a static RAM. We have some DRAM here, 64 kilobyte, which lends itself to the idea that this is probably a monochrome or Hercules compatible card. And there's an FCC ID there. I did look it up. It doesn't really tell you anything other than it makes some hits for monochrome display adapter. And looking at the video output on this, I can pretty much guarantee this is monochrome. We have two signals right here, which is the horizontal and vertical sync. And when we look at this side of the board, it's a little hard to see, but there you go. You can see that there are two traces, one for the video signal and one for the intensity bit. So two bits there for monochrome, plus the uh, horizontal vertical, vertical sync, and of course we have ground. And looking at the back of the card, nothing really identifying other than like this, I don't know, number 325172 and some stamps. So yeah, pretty generic monochrome display card. Now we have the interesting large AT&T card here. So we have an AT&T logo right there, a bunch of letters and numbers. On the back of the board, it says image capture board and there is an FCC ID. I tried to look up that ID, I didn't really find anything. And then we have presumably some kind of a serial number here, 4005, and not too much else on here. In this section right here, we have some video memory, which I think each one of these is one bit times 64K dual ported RAM. There are 16 of them, which implies some type of uh, video capture buffer of some type. Date codes on the various ICs on this board are also from 1986. And we have this IC up here, which I have no idea what that is. I kind of looked it up and didn't really find anything. There are a few jumpers here, so if you have a similar board and you're trying to get it working or you know more about this, let me know. But you can see the way this was configured. If that was a working setup, I don't know. And over in this area, we have probably the video acquisition section. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is a digital to analog converter and this must do whatever capture happens and it goes into the video buffer right here. I looked up the data sheet for this chip and it's actually a pretty interesting chip. It seems to be designed to do on-screen displays or overlays over composite video. It converts the video to RGB and it can overlay information on top of it and it outputs that with RGB. And on this card, maybe that's used for this function and then it converts the RGB back to composite. And then looking at the back here, like we saw when it was installed on the computer, we have the in, the out, which I assume are composite video, and then whatever this nine pin connector is. Now the nine pin connector has three traces on this side going to it. And on that side, 
I can see at least one trace going to it. So I don't think that's like a video connector. I don't really know what that is. So yeah, the question goes out to my viewers. Can you find any information on this mystery AT&T board? What do you think this was used for inside this computer that had only 256K of RAM and a floppy drive? All right, the next thing to look at is this floppy drive. Not too much to report here other than um, it's dirty, but everything inside the machine was quite dusty. So we have a Fujitsu Limited M2551A. So this will be a 360K double-sided floppy drive. Probably works totally fine, just needs a, a little bit of a clean. And lastly, we have the power supply. Tested okay. Hazardous voltage area. Definitely that is the case. Warning, power must be off before remove card. <laughs> okay. There's the model number SNP5104 microcomputer. Probably 130 watts, standard voltages apply. And the connector, I'm gonna say, looks pretty run of the mill. So I think I could replace this with a regular power supply. Of course, the, uh, the one difference is, is the power switch is right here. And I don't think on the back of an XT that would necessarily work. It doesn't have provisions for the big chunky switch that sticks out the side of the case. So I definitely wanna see what's working here and what's not. So I think the first thing I'm gonna do is let's try to get this power supply working and then we'll plug this into the motherboard which has that keyboard connection that's on the case. So I'm gonna to have to get the case back over here to get that hooked up. And let's see if this old thing that was abandoned in an attic can actually work. Let's get this power supply apart just to give a visual inspection inside. And of course, if there's any fireworks when I turn this on, we wanna be able to see those up close and not through a fan grill. The sticker here on this is very appropriate. So if you don't know what you're doing, don't go poking around inside power supplies, especially when they're powered up or plugged in. And even when they're off, there are capacitors in here that can give you a little bit of a shock. It, it won't be a, a long-term thing because they'll discharge when you touch them. This is definitely going to give you a zap and it will hurt and you know you might hurt yourself flinging your hands around or whatever. Okay, there we go. It's kind of rude. The fan is connected to the PCB and there isn't even a connector. Looking around in here, all looks okay. I don't see a reefa. The filter caps here are the polymer type, so they're okay. There's a Y cap, the fuse is intact. We actually have a brand name there. It's gonna be really hard to see because this stuff is in the way. It's down there. It says Skynet Electric. And then we have a couple characters in kanji with an S there. Is this like a precursor to Seasonic or something? Anyway, looking around in here, everything is dusty, but it looks really good. The caps, um, I mean, there's just a lot of dirt, obviously. Caps are all in good shape. Nothing looks exploded. Nothing looks leaking. You know, I don't know. This thing's probably gonna work just fine. So I have the light bulbs connected, one to five volt, one to 12 volt. I have this on the five volt rail. I don't have the other multimeter handy right now. Mains are connected, although this power switch should be off, but also the one on the wall is. So first let's try turning this one on. Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> I guess the uh, switch on the wall is set, it's turned on. Anyhow, we're getting an extremely bright light there. <laughs> so that's the 12 volts and we're getting 4.99 on the five volt rail. Let's check out the 12 volt rail. 12 volt rail is 11.73, so that is excellent. Let's move this LED from the 12 volts over to the five volt rail. Might be too much for the power supply. Nope. Wow, it's good, it's compensating. There's a lot of load in these light bulbs, especially when you first connect them. They're kind of like a dead short until they warm up. And uh, yeah, they're going and we're still at 5.98 volts. So we're getting good regulation on this old thing. That is sweet. You know, the fan's not even that noisy. I mean, it's moving a lot of air, but it could be worse. I'm gonna let this thing run for five minutes and just see if it stays working. All right, it's been about five minutes and this thing is working fine. Yep. I measured the current draw of these two light bulbs here. These are like dual filament light bulbs and it is about three amps at five volts. So not a lot. This power supply can definitely supply more current than that, but you know, it's something, it's more than zero. And generally these old power supplies do not appreciate being powered up with no load at all. I think before I put this back together, I'm gonna take it outside and blow the dust out of it. There we go, just like that. The inside of this thing is cleaner, not perfect, but certainly a lot nicer than it was. All right, let's put this thing back together. Now, I'm not surprised in the least that this thing actually works. It really feels like this 
clone stuff. Okay, what's going on here? Let's push this into alignment. It really feels like the stuff that was made in the 80s, the clone stuff, is just dead reliable. And I know we haven't tested any of the other parts from this computer, but I wouldn't be surprised if all of them work perfectly. And who knows how like, this thing was stored, you know, it was in an attic, it might have been super hot, super cold, super damp, all those things. And yet, the power supply at least fired right up. We're almost ready to test this motherboard. The next thing we got to do, though, is check for shorted tantalums. There are a bunch of tantalums all over these orange caps here, and they can go short. So he's got to make sure this is in the right mode. There we go. It's good to reference the power connector to uh, know where all the ground leads are, because obviously those are going to be shorted, as are the uh, five volt rails like that. But five volts to ground, can see the multimeter there. A uh, little beep like that is fine, but we're getting 340 ohms, so that's no issue. The blue wire to ground is probably like one of the minus rails or power good or something like that, and that's fine. There's a brown wire, a yellow wire, and a white wire. So let's start with the white wire on the outside here. That's fine. This would be the yellow wire, or that's actually, no, that's not connected at all. That's the yellow wire. It's fine. And that right there is the brown wire, and there's no issues. So yeah, nothing is shorted together. We should be good to go for testing. All right, now we're gonna use my post analyzer card. You can buy these online for just a few dollars. I think they're a little bit more expensive now, like eight or nine dollars. They used to be like two dollars. There, I won't expect any postcodes to display on this at all. Although this thing doesn't just look at the normal postcode IO port, which is I think 80 but it also looks at 84 and 300. So it will display whatever is written to any of those ports. And on a lot of XT BIOSes, that results in stuff happening on here. If the CPU was dead or the motherboard were dead, we wouldn't get anything displayed on here, but we'll at least be able to see the power rails and if the reset circuit is good. Not to mention I can hook up this speaker using this wire here. So we can hear if there's any beep codes. All right, we are good to go for testing. Speakers hooked up. Card is in the right way, power supply is connected. I'm just gonna hold the motherboard up at an angle so we can turn this on and see if we have any sparks. Yes, we have a short circuit. <laughs> Something shorted to keep the power supply from starting. Well, what was that exactly? That is actually kind of interesting because I checked for shorts and there weren't any, but maybe there are some now. It's possible as soon as the power was applied, it caused a short on one of the rails. I'm just going to test with the connector actually in the in here. Okay, five volts is fine. Blue wire, that's fine. Okay, we'll test to this brown wire here. Okay, totally fine. Yellow. Ah, we have a short on the 12 volt rail now that we didn't before. All right, yes. Yeah, so that, you know, when I've had shorted tantalums, okay, this power connector is really hard to get off. Let's get this off here with the screwdriver. There we go, that's that's easier. Okay, let's just test that one more time. So the 12 volt rail is the third pin. Let's just check here. I mean, didn't I just test that and there wasn't a short unless I missed a pin or something? That's the yellow wire, it's fine. And I was beginning to say that I found that when tantalums go bad, it always seems to be the 12 volt rail ones that do. And I wouldn't be surprised if they were 16 volt tantalums. And I think that's probably a little bit too close to the 12 volts. They should be spec'd at 25 volts and the failure mode of tantalums is a short. So the way to find which cap is shorted is to put this thing on continuity mode like it is here. So it's beeping. And then first you gotta start finding all the caps that are shorted and maybe use a little marker, like a Sharpie or something to mark which ones are actually shorted. And then you gotta go around again to the shorted caps and figure out which has the lowest resistance. And you need to use a multimeter that has a pretty good capability of doing that. So see when I short the leads, 0.1516 ohms. Well, we're gonna see that slight variance when we go around to all the caps on here. And that's what we need to look for. Now for 12 volts, it's very unlikely anything that 12 volts is over in this area because the only thing that uses 12 volts is gonna be the ISA bus right here. So that is where we need to focus our attention. So there's a tantalum, that's fine. Let's just check these, those are okay. Maybe these over here. Nope, they're fine. Maybe this one. Okay, so that one has a short of 0.2. If we go over here to the connector, 
0 0.26, 0 0.25, you see, so it's higher. Well, the resistance is, it's, um, oh, the terminology, I always use it the wrong way. The resistance is lower over here on this cap than it is on the connector. Now, if we had more caps that were on that rail, and I doubt there are any, these are probably all five volts. I bet you that's the only one. I guess that's one way they cut corners because the IBM motherboards have more caps uh, right here by the connector. And then there's also some on the slots. That one is probably the one that is causing the short. So let's just pop it out. A little fresh solder on there. And let's use some of this braid here to try to get this part out. Nah, that didn't really release it, even though it looks like it cleaned up the solder on there. So I'm gonna use some of these hemostats here, which will allow me to kind of yank the part out. I could pull it out of the board without actually touching it. And now we can just heat up the board right here. There we go. So there's our part that I just popped out. And let's see what it says on here. And it says 16 volts. So exactly like I thought, 22 microfarad it looks like. Unfortunately, I think that's just a little bit too close to the 12 volts on these types of caps. And that can cause the short, but of course, is that actually the one that's shorted? Well, let's first see if the two pins here are shorted now. Nope. And let's look at this. Yep. That is a dead short. So that cap right there, that failed. And it was working and it failed as soon as we applied power. Not surprised. All right, the cap came out right here and it is marked with a plus on there. Although, you know, if I couldn't figure out which one was plus, all you gotta do is put it on the plus lead there, check the uh, power connector over here. So I know that's the positive side. I'm gonna install this. It's a 100 microfarad, 25 volt cap. I just happen to have it handy. It'll be perfect in here. New cap is installed. I just sort of heated up the pads and pushed it through. And just for a sanity check, let's just double check that we do not have a short anymore here. Nope, we're all good. Now we're back to where we were a moment ago. Speakers already hooked up, postcard is in, power supply is connected. Let's try turning this on again. There we go. All right, we're getting beep codes. It did zero that out, so that's interesting. Um, all the voltage rails look good though. That cap is what needed to be changed. Now I have to say, when it comes to old PCs, like the original PC and the original XT and then some of the clones, these shorted caps seem to be like the most common failure, I guess, besides RAM failures on those machines. So always check to see if you have a shorted cap. And then if you go to turn it on and then the power supply doesn't even start, don't assume right away your power supply is bad. Definitely check for shorted voltage rails, just like we did to isolate this shorted cap. I think I've had at least a few videos on this channel where this was the only problem with the computer that kept it from running. So it's not hard to find if you have a multimeter and worst case, you could just cut this off and the thing would have worked just fine. Especially on the 12 volt rail, these capacitors are not critical to the operation of the computer. So just removing them will make your computer work again. And worst case, you might have an ISA card that misbehaves a little bit because this cap is missing. But generally, well, I don't have, a, the cards are all over here on the floor. They usually have their own capacitors on there as well to smooth those rails. So yeah, what's this really gonna do? Not a whole lot. While that motherboard has signs of life, which is a really great sign, so it probably does work. Next thing is we need a display on it. And I wanna test this monochrome card, but because I don't know that motherboard is actually working or not, let's test this first on another motherboard, a known good working one, just to rule out the possibility that, you know, this doesn't come up. I might think it's the card, but the reality is that other motherboard might be having a problem. So let's use my 3D6SX40 system here, which I know works and I've done so much testing on this to test to see if this MDA card is working. Now, one thing that's interesting is you see this little cutout here. That means that you cannot stick this into a 16-bit slot because it will interfere here. Luckily, this particular motherboard has two slots that I can use this in. So I can just pop this in right there and it does actually clear. For capturing the video output or using this on a modern monitor for that matter, I'm gonna be using the RGB to HDMI, which is a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is in here with an extra CPLD board on top of it. And in this configuration, this accepts TTL RGB video, including monochrome. So this is what we're gonna be testing. This will give us a pixel perfect output once it's configured correctly. And you can hook up a modern HDMI monitor or a VGA monitor through a converter, HDMI to a VGA converter, 
or of course, in my case, a capture device. All right, there we go. We have pixel perfect monochrome display from this card. So it's working. Let me plug in my XT to IDE here so we can boot this thing up and just check for Hercules compatibility. Planet X3 or any of David Murray's games, there's a really good test here. So we have Hercules mode. We'll just do PC speaker. There it is. Okay, so the fact that it's shimmering is not a fault on the card again. This is a problem with the RGB to HDMI. It's not a problem, it's just the settings aren't quite right. And there we go. So this is how the auto switching works. If we look in the menu here, it says Hercules graphics. It looks freaking perfect and fantastic. And look at that Hercules graphics in Planet X3. Very nice, very, very nice. I'm just running through a few quick tests as well and check it, and everything seems to check out on this card. I don't have a way to easily test the parallel port, nor does it really matter, honestly. I just wanted to make sure the video card is working, and it definitely is working properly. So I'm sitting here editing this video, and I realized that I lost some footage. I've been having some problems with OBS since I updated the latest version, and it looks like the file of some testing here got corrupted. Now in the lost footage, unfortunately included my freaking works moment when I plugged the video card into the motherboard, which we tested earlier, and it actually posted. I saw the BIOS screen. Now testing on the bench, I didn't have a keyboard connected because remember the keyboard connection is in the case with that cable. And I thought I was gonna have to put this motherboard back into the case for further testing. And with that, that's where we pick up with the footage that did not get lost. I just had the realization that the keyboard connector and cable could be easily unscrewed and removed from that case. So I went ahead and I did that. And let's plug in my XT compatible keyboard here. And here we go. Let's see if this is working. There it is. Control, Alt, Delete to skip the RAM test. I think that's just so funny. There's a possibility the keyboard this thing uses is somehow proprietary. So we'll figure that out shortly. It does say keyboard there. Keyboard wasn't connected and it still said keyboard. I'm not sure what that's all about. Now, I think it would be very unlikely this uses some kind of a custom keyboard. Oh, the fact the cursor's in the wrong spot is because I'm using this Nancy driver. It's like an ANSI driver that is high speed. It doesn't really work properly with monochrome cards, but oh, wow, I have no keyboard. Ah, I think part of it is that it's an auto switching keyboard and I think it's in AT mode. Yes, it is. So let's power cycle the computer here. I could have just hit the reset button, but we'll do power cycle instead. Oh, look, it doesn't say keyboard anymore. Okay, so the fact that it said keyboard before meant that that was a keyboard error. Very interesting. Now there's only one bank of RAM. It doesn't seem to indicate that there's any kind of problem with the other banks. Let's see if I can skip the startup sequence. Yes, I did a held down shift. This is the keyboard working. All right. I was gonna run check it, but it's too big to fit in memory because of course this thing only has 256K of RAM, which only gives us 200K usable with this DOS 6. How about speed 600? I'm just trying to get a feel for how fast the processor is. There we go, this is actually running. I'm sure this is running at 4.77 megahertz. Sorry, I gotta look around the camera to see the screen here. Yes, we're at 4.781 megahertz, so a slight boost. And the fact is we have a V20 here, which gives us a performance boost over the 8088. And I think I have a little program called MIPS here, which should help us with that. And while this benchmark is completely synthetic, and it's not like this is a real world thing, it does seem to indicate we have like a 33% improvement in performance at the same clock speed by just dropping in the NEC V20. Now, I'm sure people have done much more extensive videos about like what the actual performance improvement is. I always thought that it was a noticeable improvement, but I don't think it was 33% faster, but maybe, I guess it all depends on what your software is doing. Obviously register to register transfers is two times faster. And what you do see also is even with the improvement of the V20, it still pales in comparison to an eight megahertz 286 or uh, whatever, like 16 megahertz 386. Well, let's keep going with the testing here. We could try putting this AT&T card into the computer. I don't think anything's gonna happen whatsoever, but I don't know, we might as well try. Of course, what could happen is this has a bunch of tantalums on here and that could create a short. <laughs> and let's also hook up this floppy drive controller and we'll plug in that floppy drive just to see if uh, that thing is working. 
Now for me to do proper testing, I'm not gonna really be able to do it with only 256K of RAM. So we gotta expand the memory of this thing. Obviously I could just install additional chips on here, but that's a bit of a pain. So I'm gonna use my ISA RAM expansion card, the one that I made and designed. It's on my GitHub. It uses a single 512K SRAM here and we have some configuration switches. And yeah, I think this card is pretty good. It's low cost, it's easy to make, and it can upgrade your machine up to 640K or even allow you to have some upper memory depending on the RAM configuration of your system. So if we look at the back here, the way this works is it works in 128K banks. Well, we already have 256K. So we need to disable this card for the first two banks. Basically, switch one and two need to be on because we need to disable the memory on this card that the motherboard already has. Now we look at this switch block. I put red paint over the switch numbers because you gotta look at the PCB. So one and two need to be on to disable the first 256K in this. And then we're gonna enable the next three banks, which are gonna give us 640K possible. So this is the configuration we're gonna use and hopefully it will bring this computer up to 640K. Now, obviously this doesn't have this extra memory that this card is gonna do on the motherboard, but it's still possible that the bus transceivers are gonna create bus conflicts or whatever. So this may or may not work. We might need to look up or try to guess on the jumpers or the dip switches over here to try to disable that memory altogether. But let's just see what happens. And there is an LED on here that shows when this card is being accessed, which is a feature I kind of added because I like it. And we're getting some blinky blinks there. And we switch here and I don't know, whoa, bank five, six, seven, eight, what? Okay, okay, let's think about this. So it must be counting the memory in 64K chunks. So one, two, three, four, which is originally what we saw was that first 256K. And I think now we have 640K and I cannot type. Why can't I type what happened here? Pushing keys on the keyboard results in beepy beepy sounds. Let's uh, reboot this thing. I use the reset jumper there. Control Alt Delete. Let's try that. Oh, that actually did skip it. I have a feeling something that I have in my config this or auto exec is causing the keyboard not to work because yeah, it's working fine now. So if we go mem, what do we got? 640K, we have one less, but that's just due to the way this computer works. Sweet, so now we can run programs, all thanks to my little cool little card there. And I'm gonna run Check It here, take a look at the LED on the card there, see how it starts blinking as Check It starts to load. And that's because Check It is now running inside the memory on this card. All right, so there it is working, <laughs> of course it is. Uh, the reason why it's got those like stripes and stuff is because Check It is set for color mode. So let's take a look at the performance in here. So 384 dry stones. Do I know what a regular XT is? No, I, of course I don't. Oh, right there, I aborted the test on the math test, but there you go, 1.13 times the XT. So another synthetic benchmark and yeah, there it is. So here in Check It, I wanna try to see if this video capture card, this AT&T card is using up any space in memory. Now this particular test is not super accurate and usually you have to go into debug to check for sure if there's actually RAM that exists up here. But we have the 4K of video memory and we have to remember that this thing actually has 64K. But I don't remember how a Hercules card actually maps that memory into here. It says there is some high memory here, but this again could just be the Hercules card with some of the way that that additional screen RAM is mapped into memory. Then it says there's a whole lot of nothing, this 240K of nothing. And this is where you could try to insert some of the high memory. If you had a RAM card like mine, you could use some of those additional banks if the motherboard was already populated with 640K to add high memory into there, where you could actually load DOS, um, all of DOS into that high memory, which would give you a lot more RAM available on your XT class system. And then we have the system ROM here, which according to this is actually 48K, which sounds rather unlikely because looking at the chip on the motherboard that's actually installed, it's only a 2764, that's 8K in size. So I don't know why this is thinking there's somehow 48K. But either way, nothing is really showing up in here. And actually, I just realized something. The XT IDE card is installed in this, and this has a ROM BIOS, and it's not even showing up in here. So this check is just pretty terrible, actually, for trying to find if you have actual ROMs or RAM in this upper memory space. Now, speaking of the ROM BIOS, let's dump it. I don't need to take the chip out. I'm gonna use this program here called ROM Dump, a program I found somewhere, I don't even know where. The Pascal source code is right there, and this will dump any of the ROMs that are found in the system and save them to the, the hard drive, which in this case is a compact flashcard. So it allows me to easily dump a ROM and then copy it off onto my PC. 
So in a directory called handwell, we're just gonna run ROM dumper. And there it is, scanning memory, and it's saving whatever it finds with ROM signatures into files. And strangely enough, we have three files. One of those is gonna be the XT IDE BIOS, but those other two, I don't know. Let's take a look on the PC. Okay, so the first file, the one that starts with a D, was definitely the XT IDE BIOS, and I only have an 8K chip on there, so that's exactly what that is. Moving on to the next file, uh, it's a lot of blank but I'm assuming up at the top, we're gonna have a mirror of the system BIOS. No, we don't. Why did it even dump that? That's unusual. And then looking at this third file, we should have a whole lot of blank except for the very top 8K, which should start up in the F whatever, way at the top there. And then there it is. Let's make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to read because I know you're probably watching on your phone. Right here at the start, this is not IBM BIOS. <laughs> well, I wonder who did make this. Is it Copam 1985? I really am curious. Let's see what else we see in here. Video RAM test bad. Press control delete to skip RAM test. We already saw that message. We have RAM test, we have ROM error. Then we have disk not setting okay. <laughs> What's that? Parity error. Press escape key goon, but skip parity. I don't know for sure if these messages would appear this way when the BIOS was actually displaying them or, or what. Press control delete boot again. It's probably gonna be it for strings because there's just not a lot of ROM space in this BIOS to do a whole lot more. Oh, there is some more here, disk keyboard. I wouldn't be surprised if this right here are all the RAM banks that it could possibly test because you saw it was testing the RAM banks and it had like one, two, three, four, five, all the way through A. But there really isn't too much more except at the end here. 1986 copyright version 3.86 and then it has Copam again. It's gotta be the company name. I mean, I don't know. I went ahead and created a new file that's just 8K in size. So I'll be uploading this to archive.org. I'll put a link in the description below. So if you wanna play around with this particular BIOS, you can. I'll also send a picture of this motherboard and the BIOS over to the retro web. So that'll be up there as well for anyone in the future. I really love this RAM test. I think it's quite cool actually. I'm assuming if there's any bit errors in the eight bits in that bank, it's just gonna put a one right there to tell you that there's a problem. That is frankly awesome. That is so much clearer than what the way IBM does it with that code which you have to decipher and it's a big pain. This BIOS kind of rocks. All right, I booted the system back up because I wanted to test out this floppy drive here. So it's all connected up to the original floppy drive controller. And I'm gonna use IMD as I normally do for testing this drive. First, we're gonna clean the heads because there was so much dust. I'm sure it's dusty on the inside. So I'm just gonna put some IPA. I'm not so sure about this drive. It didn't spin or do anything when I actually stuck the disc in, but let's just see what happens. Oh, never mind. It's freaking working. Let's put this the right way up. These generally aren't happy running upside down. They're okay running on their sides, but not upside down. All right, I have a double density disc here. I don't know what's on it. So we'll see if we can read this. And if not, then I'll just um, image it with uh, something. So you go to a line, disc is spinning. Oh, it's okay, it's freaking working. So 18 is the normal reading you should be getting and that beep uh, for double density discs like this. So if we go to track 30, it's normal to have like one sector that reads incorrectly. And we'll go to 40, it's not gonna read. I push minus to go back to 39 and we're good. And we'll push H to check both heads and we're good. Track 20, wow, this thing freaking works. So let's look what's on A here, nothing. Let's copy IMD over here to the A drive. Let's just see if it can write to it properly. It seems like it's working fine. And there we go, six files copied. In fact, yeah, there we go, it looks good. Why don't we format the disk here, slash S, uh, I think U for unconditional, and this should make a system bootable disk, which I can just leave in this disk drive and should be able to boot this system once I take the XT IDE card out of it. All right, there we go, formatted, transferred the system, took up a lot of the space because this is DOS 622, I'm pretty sure, yes it is, so it's not really ideal for running off a 360K disk. But if we turn the system off here and I pull the XT IDE out and we turn it back on, system should boot off this floppy disk here once it does this awesome RAM test. This BIOS is so cool. I may end up using this in other ones of my systems. I wonder what the ID 6112082 is. 
is that the date is 6112082, what we actually saw on the motherboard. No, what's on the motherboard is 820804. That was what I thought was a date code. Anyways, there we are, we booted off the floppy disk. This computer all just totally freaking works. I mean, except for that bad tantalum, this, yeah, not surprised, but still pretty darn cool. Well, take a look at this. The computer is all back together and it's running a game. It's running Blockout, which is like a 3D Tetris. It's uh, the demo, obviously, because I'm not touching the keyboard. Now, in case you're wondering how I'm displaying monochrome Hercules graphics on a 17 inch Sony Trinitron monitor, the awesome RGB to HDMI is at work again. And as I mentioned earlier, an HDMI to RGB adapter. This is just one that would cost a few dollars off eBay a while ago converts the HDMI signal to VGA that this monitor can use. It's all it takes to get pixel perfect monochrome display or CGA or whatever your old computer outputs on something like a VGA monitor and it looks oh so good. We go into the palette menu here, we can actually change the color so it's green or, well it says amber, but I have to say that looks more yellow than anything. But the green mode looks frankly amazing. So that is going to be it for this PC archaeology episode. This machine was kind of boring. I mean, there wasn't really much interesting stuff going on inside, other than the fact that the motherboard was very unusual with that slot spacing and the fact that you can't use any other motherboard in this case or you can't use this motherboard in any other case. So what a weird combo. I'd love to know if anyone's ever seen motherboards like this before used in other clones. And of course, then that comes to this AT&T image capture card. Who has seen this in use in anything? I'd really love to know how this card was being used in the system with only 256K of RAM and a single floppy drive with no hard drive. That whole thing just seems very unusual to me. So anyhow, that's gonna be it for this video. This machine is very well built and very solid. So it just works and it's probably gonna work for you know 20 more years after this. If you like this video, thumbs up would be appreciated. Subscribe if you haven't all the usual YouTube junk. And a huge thanks to my patrons. They make all this possible now I do this full time. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. Patrons get early access to videos, behind the scenes stuff, all the usual stuff like that. And I think that is gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.